I, I tend to preach a couple of times a month at different churches around our district. Our district includes five states, uh, Louisiana, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, and Nebraska is our district. It's a funny shaped district, but I get to travel those wonderful states. And, and uh, I, I love it when I get to come to Louisiana. I don't get to come to Louisiana as often as I'd like. Um, and, and part of, of the solution to that is to have more churches in Louisiana so that I could come visit more often. So I didn't, I didn't prepare Dwight at all for this, but I feel after that story, uh, Dwight should come up and, and greet you himself. Dwight is the former district superintendent of this district, and he is a great friend of mine. And, and he resigned his church in Plano, Texas last year and has started an organization called Thousand Churches. And, and I want him to just greet you. Dwight, I want to have you come up. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, but he's traveling with us this week. We met with uh, most of our Louisiana pastors yesterday in, in a town that is not pronounced how it is spelled, I learned. Natchitoches is where we met. That's not how it's spelled, um, as you know. Uh, but that's where we met. And Dwight's got... Uh, I had Dwight and Sherry travel with us this weekend because uh, they're going to be a very important part of what's... Uh, what the Wesleyan Church is planning to do in Louisiana. So just give a greeting, a response to Ken if you want, and, and say a couple words about what Thousand Churches is. First of all, I'm offended that nobody ever said that about me when I preached here, because I, I did preach here, I'm just saying. And you're saying nobody ever said anything, nothing similar to that before. No, okay, all right. You. Your mind is slipping is probably what's, what's actually going on now. Hey, greetings. It is great to be back, and uh, we love Louisiana. I've lived in several states, and yet when Sherry and I think of home, we think of uh, Louisiana. And by the way, as they think about that town that you had such a hard time saying, they've never even thought about the fact that it wasn't spelled like it said. It just comes out. That's what the locals, right? That's what you say, and that's all those uh, different um, streets in New Orleans that we would have no idea how to say, except we grew up saying them, right? And uh, for those of you who don't know, I actually pastored for uh, 12 years in New Orleans, thus I'm representing. And uh, here's another funny story back, this has been years ago, uh, it was Orrin Atkins, right, that was here, Atkinson was here before, and uh, so you see that drywall right there? there? I should know I put that up, so that's why I'm sitting on that side, because I actually put that drywall up when we were building this service, but... Uh, Thank you for having us. It is a joy every time we get to be back in uh, Louisiana, and it is a joy to be in your church. I actually attended uh, this church, and it was downtown. Is that the location of the old, I don't know if they called that downtown, but uh, before you all moved out this way. And I love you guys. I've known many of those who came before you, and maybe some of you were some of them, but made this church possible. And it is just a, a great church and has a place in my heart. So we're grateful for having uh, for you having us. And uh, what Billy referenced is this idea that we want to plant more churches in Louisiana. And we think uh, Louisiana needs more folks like you in churches around Louisiana that love Jesus with their whole heart. And uh, show them a little bit about what it means to be on fire for Jesus. And if we can do that, we would love your help in doing that. So as you think about places in Louisiana or people that need a church like this in another place in Louisiana, slip me a note, drop me, drop me an email, let Ken know. But I want you to know part of what my goal is in life is to helping multi help multipliers. Those are church planters. Those are folks who say, man, I think that place over there needs a church. And I feel like Ken just read this passage right out of Isaiah. Here am I, send me. We need a few folks who will say, here am I, send me over there because that place needs a gospel-centered church, right? They need to know that Jesus loves them, and I'm willing to go there and make sure they know that. So if there's places like that on your heart, let us know. If there are people, maybe even in this room today, that would say, hey, here am I, send me, let me know that. And kind of what I want to do with the rest of my life is help to start a thousand churches around the world uh, so that more people might come to know Jesus. So thanks for having us. And uh, by the way, Billy, you are pretty good looking here. <laughs> Well, thanks, Dwight. I, uh, I love when we get to spend time with Dwight and Sherry. Um, they are great friends of ours, and, and I love his heart to, to plant churches. And, and I, I think if you would um, just sort of pay attention for a couple of minutes about what's going on in the world, you would, you would agree with me when we say the world is in need of more churches. Uh, maybe not more government. Uh, maybe not... Um, <coughs> more news channels, but maybe more churches. 
And so, so uh, we pay attention to what's going on in the world. And I think you would agree with me that the, the world is kind of sick. The world is kind of broken. And if, you, if, you, if you're paying attention of, of where we are, 2020 has been, uh, I mean, we've, we've known that the world is in need of a lot of stuff for a lot of years. But then 2020 comes along and you're like, oh, wow, do we need some help. We've got this pandemic thing going on. We've got uh, racial strife going on. We've got an election uh, that's happening, and and and, and it's just it's it's come to a place where we would say uh, this year, along with other years in the history of the world, but this year especially, would say, God help us, we're in trouble. And when when Pastor Ken reads this passage about this God who is transcendent and he is above all and he's more glorious than a, what we would consider a holy guy like Isaiah can even look at or feel like he's worthy to be in the presence of and he's this God who is above all and he is holy and we would be in this broken world what would what would make a God that is so holy look upon us in this broken world and even care. Except for this fact that we keep coming back to and we sang about this morning is that we can cry out to a God like that because somehow we know He loves us. That God, that holy God loves me. Why do we know? Because the Bible tells us that. He tells us that over and over again. And so, so as we see the world in need of saving... The scripture tells us that there is the God who created all of this, who so loved this world that he acted. So we're going to talk about this morning uh, about how he acted and about what he did when he acted. We, we know this, this, this wonderful truth, John 3, 16, that God so loved this world that he did what? He sent his son. Like when, when nothing else would do, when nothing else would work, he sent his son into the world to save it. Now, so let's talk about for a minute, how did his son go about saving the world? Because if we look at how he did it then, we might get an idea of how he wants to do it today. Because the world is still in need of saving. So what, what did Jesus do? He arrives on the scene. He is... Raised as a good Jewish man, fulfilling all of the laws and, and, and everything that, that a, a good holy man would do. And then he sets out. When he starts his ministry, he sets out and he has some very strate strategic initiatives. And, and, and here's what he does. He says, I'm not going to do this by myself because I won't be here forever. So I'm going to call disciples to follow me. This is his big strategy. Now, he doesn't go to kings or world leaders. He goes to people like fishermen, tax collectors, common people, and he invites them to follow him. Now, there's a story in Luke chapter 5, and, and you can turn there if you want. I'm just going to tell you the story, and then and a little bit later I'm going to uh, read a passage out of Matthew 25. So that's what we're going to be this morning. So, so Luke 5 is where he's at the beginning of his ministry, and he has not yet really invited certain people that we would come to know as the disciples or the 12 to follow him. But he's, he's just starting into that road. And he, and he, he goes to um, uh, some water. There's some fishermen there. And, and he sees them like cleaning their nets. They've been out all night fishing. And, 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 he's, and he's testing some people to see if they would be one of the few that would follow him for the next few years, that he could invest in them and teach them what the kingdom of God is like so that they could go out into all the world and, and raise up disciples or followers of him. And this is how he would save the world, by inviting people to follow him so that he could teach them this is how life is supposed to work and the world would be saved. When you live life the right way, the world will be saved. So let me show you how to be saved, he says. And so, so he's got to find some people that he can invest the next few years in. So he, he comes along a guy that's cleaning his nets. His name is Simon. They, they would change his name to Peter. And, and uh, that's how you know him is, is a guy named Peter. So he is cleaning his nets. Jesus uh, has already developed a little bit of a following 
Uh, so the crowds have come. Uh, they hear of this, this guy who teaches with power, uh, this, this rabbi who is doing some miracles. So you, you start doing some miracles and crowds start to show up. Right. So the crowds have come. And so he, he goes over to Peter and he says, can I borrow your boat for a little while? I want to do some teaching to people and, and I could really use your boat so that they could hear me better. And, uh, and so Peter says, go ahead. And so he, he, he borrows the boat, uh, does his teaching, and then he sends the crowd home. And now if you're, you're Peter, now I want you to put yourself in Peter's place for a second. He, he's been out all night. He's been fishing, working hard. Now he's cleaning his nets because he's got to go get a little bit of sleep so he can do this all over again. And it's been a rough night fishing, they say. Luke says this is like no fish, working hard, no results. And Jesus says, hey, Peter, let's go do some fishing now. And Peter's like, well, I, we, 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 we just did that. We, we're, we're going home. Jesus, let's go do some fishing. All right, if you say so. So they go out, set out on the boat a little bit. Uh, and, and Peter's, you know, you just imagine Peter's about to throw the net in. Jesus, no, 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 throw them over here. Now, Peter is a professional fisherman. This is how he makes his living. Jesus is a rabbi. He grew up as a carpenter, they say. So he's a tradesman, not necessarily a fisherman. And here he is telling Peter where to put the nets. Now, now here's, here's why I'm telling you the story. Because there's a, there's a certain response that Peter has um, that goes like this. Jesus says, drop the nets Right here. Do this specific thing I'm asking you to do. Peter's response are these words. Because you say so, I will. Because you say so, I will. Now, was Jesus, was Jesus really interested in fishing that day? Probably not. He's calling disciples. He's, he's calling people who he needs to know, are you going to follow me and do what I ask you to do even when it doesn't make sense? But because I say so, you will. So Peter passes this test that day with those words, because you say so, I will. So then they, they the story goes, they, they drop the nets right there, they bring in so many fish, the, the boats start to sink, all this stuff, and they're... And, and Peter realizes, much like Isaiah, he has the same response as Isaiah had in the passage that Pastor Ken read. He says, I am not holy enough, worthy enough to be around you. I need you to get away from me because I, I am just a common, sinful man in the presence of something holy. And Jesus has the same response. He says, no, 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 I, I will save you and I will use you to save others. And this is how he calls Peter to be his disciple. So if the world is still in need of saving and God still loves this world and we see how Jesus set out to save the world by inviting people to follow him and how did he invite? Let me just ask you to do something specific and you respond in obedience and he says it and we do it and we follow him. And the world is saved in this way. It sounds simple enough, but it's very difficult to do it. I, I want you to, to take a little bit of inventory of your life. And I'll, I'll come back to this question, but I'll ask it now so, so maybe the Holy Spirit can, can talk to you for a few minutes before we're finished. Is there anything where Jesus has asked you to do something that may sound a little odd, like dropping your nets or something equivalent. Something that, that, you, you, that, that you just feel like, maybe you've sat in these chairs at one point this year and, and, and heard just like a whisper or, or felt a nudge and you think, that might be the Holy Spirit and he's asking me to do something, but it just doesn't make sense. He wants me to go talk to who? He wants me to go do what? He wants me to give away what? And it doesn't make sense. And, and, and you don't want to say, because you say so, I will, because it might hurt and it might require some sacrifice. But I, I, I don't know what that would be, but, may, but just think for a minute if, if there is that thing. And, I, and then I want to tell a, a more 
I don't know if I told this story here before, but uh, it's been a while, so you've forgotten it. Um, and, and Kim was not with me last time. And I, 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 never, I never miss an opportunity to embarrass Kim. And, and so here's a story. It's, it's, about, um, the, it's about when we were dating, right? Um, so he, when I started dating as a, as a teenager, I found this, this girl uh, that went to another high school, but she was a friend of a friend. And, and there was a, a banquet of some sort at my school that was coming up. And, and she was cute. And um, my friend uh, knew her. And so I, I did what every uh, brave young 16-year-old would do uh, when he finds a cute girl and asks and wants to ask her to go somewhere. With, he gets his mom to talk to her mom so she could talk to her daughter. And that's what I did. Worked perfectly. Now... Now, that girl was not Kim. That girl was Kim's twin sister. So, so I went on that date with Kim's twin sister, Angie, and then several other dates because that date, it didn't go all that great, to be honest with you, but she was cute and she was polite and she didn't, uh, she was, uh, when, we, when I would take her out to eat, she would order uh, like the cheapest salad and water and I just thought that was great characteristic in a girl because I was always broke and so I could afford that date. And, and she was just, you know, sweet. And so after about a year of just, you know, every once in a while we would go and do something. Or if I had some, an event at school or something, I would, I would bring her. Um, and, and I remember just thinking uh, along the way, she's cute. I like her. But man, it's just, it feels like every day is just kind of work. Until this one day. And this one day, I was, I, I was, I would play basketball back in those days and, and had a, a game and, and, and I had Angie meet me after a game. We were going to go uh, hang out with some friends. And, uh, and, and so this is, we're on another date. And all of a sudden, things are clicking and things are going really, really, really well. The conversation is flowing and she's laughing at my jokes. And it's just like, finally, all this work has paid off. All this, all this investment I put into Angie, now she's just like... This is great. Finally, we're clicking. And then I realize why we're clicking is because it's not Angie. Kim has come on the date in Angie's place. Now, Kim and Angie are identical twins, and I could not tell them apart to save my life. And they had fun with me about this, and and would they would tell me later that they would just keep. You know, when I would call, they would one would answer, and the other the other one would you know give her a break or something, and they would just go back. So th they were quite mean. And on this night, they decided, uh, let's see if he can tell us apart, and we'll go on this date. Now, so now I've got a, a dilemma. Um, I've got a year in with Angie. But then Kim comes along and is like, well, she looks like Angie, so she's just as cute. But we had a little bit more chemistry. We had a little bit more fun that night. But I can't just go to Angie, the twin sister, and say, we're done. I'm going with your sister because then I lose them both, right? What would you do? <laughs> well, here's what I did. I started asking them both out at the same time. And I would bring a buddy. And we would just, they we don't know who's with who. We're just going to see where this goes. <laughs> and we would just go bowling, or we'd go to a park, or we would go to a movie, and we would just like, oh, well, there's an empty seat. Also. And, and, and this goes on for several months. And I'm still like, I'm not exactly sure which one I'm supposed to like pursue. <laughs> Until this one fateful night. Here's the story. All right. So, uh, I was a little sore. Uh, can you say is that the right word? I was a little. Kim and Angie would make fun of me for not being able to tell them apart. And this this one night that they switched on me, and everybody's you know having this great laugh at my expense. And I and I had told them at the end of this that one day where they switched, I said I will get you back someday. Don't know how. I'll get you back. Here's how I got them back. Beautiful story. Okay. Um, I haven't told this story. Okay, so 
So I'll, I'll give you all the details. I, uh, I had uh, two best friends in those days, Mark and Johnny, and uh, uh, so uh, I told the girls, I'm gonna come pick you up and we're gonna go uh, to this other friend's house where everybody's hanging out this night. And, and so I go pick them up um, uh, just myself, but right before I'd gotten there, I had dropped off Mark and Johnny in the woods just near their house. And so I, as I pick up the girls and we're coming down the hill from their house, uh, I I've pretended I was having car trouble. And I pull off into this wooded area where there's no lights and there's no people, there's no traffic. And the girls are saying, no, 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 go. There, don't pull your car into there. This is, a, this is not safe. And I said, it'll be just fine. I'm 17 by this point and very strong. And uh, so, I, so I'm, I'm telling you, it's no big deal. I got it. So I, I go, you know, I'm under the hood and, and looking at a car problem that doesn't exist. And here comes Mark and Johnny out of the woods, you know, walking out of the woods, carrying baseball bats and wearing ski masks. And, and I'm hearing screams from inside the car saying, turn around, look, there's somebody coming, get back in the car, we gotta go. And I'm like, what, I can't hear you, I'm working on the car and I'm, I'm back here. And Mark and Johnny come along and they, they just start beating the ever-living daylights out of me. You know, WWF style, right? We were just throwing each other across the car and we are, this is before cell phones exist, which was a wonderful time. So nobody's calling 911 or anything like that. But the girls are just losing it in the car. And we are <laughs> laughing and they're screaming and they're crying and it's just wonderful revenge. Until, you know, like we're, we're you know, like the car's here and then the, the fight's going on over here and I hear the engine start. And I'm underneath Mark and Johnny who are just going like this and we're laughing and just playing it up. And I say, guys, you got to let me up. Because if they get out of here, they're calling the police and we're getting in big trouble. And then the car takes off. <laughs> they left me. Exactly. So I'm running now after the car, sprinting. And finally, once they get to the highway, I see the brake lights come on. And I catch up to the car. And I open the car door. And they are crying. And saying, jump in, jump in, jump in. And I'm laughing like, why are you laughing? And then Mark and Johnny catch up and the ski masks are off. And, and then I find out what had happened in that car. Kim, who was sitting in the passenger seat, and Angie, who was in the back seat, had been having this argument. Angie saying, Kim, get in the driver's seat, take off, let's go. And Kim saying, no, we can't leave him. And Angie saying, we're leaving him. She jumps from the back seat to the front seat, starts the car, while Kim is saying, no, don't leave him. Now, I had my very own, because you say so, I will, enlightening moment, right at that point, where I realized what had happened. One was willing to leave me for dead. <laughs> and she actually said these words. He's already dead. <laughs> she said these words. He's already dead, and if we stay here, we'll die too. Let's go. And Kim is saying, no, we can't leave him behind. Now, which one do you think the Lord told me that night I was supposed to be with? The rest is history. We've dated for the next few years, got married. Now we have four kids, grown kids together. Our youngest is in college at Oklahoma Wesley. And then we got three grandkids. Now 2020, you may think 2020 has been awful. 2020 has been good to me. I've got three grandkids this year. I've got another one on the way in the spring. It's awesome. So this moment where you realize what you're willing to give up for someone else. I think, I, think I, I tell that story because I think Jesus is still looking for people who will give it all up. And, and, and we know what happened, like the rest of the story in Luke 5, 
The because you say so I will. And Jesus says, I tell you what, you passed that test. You you were willing to just do what I say. Come and follow me. And we see Peter just like I'm in drops the nets. I will give up my life to follow you. And he would. Now, he, he would have bad days and there would be that one night when he he denied Jesus and all that stuff. But Peter was in it to the end. This is how Jesus is going to save the world still. Who is in it to the end? Who is in it with the attitude of because you say so, I will. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't even like it because you said so, though, I will do it. See, Jesus comes along and, and it's not necessarily the big thing he asks us at first. Sometimes it's just something very small, but an act of obedience. Like, like, like Peter, just drop the nets. And then he watches. What are we going to do with that small thing he gave us to do? But he has in mind something big later on. Now, now I want to read you a story in Matthew 25. I'll, I'll read. It's, it's a fairly long passage, so stick with me for a little bit. Um, and, then, and then I'll just make a couple of points. And then we, we can wrap this up. Now, like the first story is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This story takes place at the very end of his ministry on earth. Like this is, he tells this parable the week he is crucified. So I, I think this is like the Tuesday night on the week he is crucified. And so he has been teaching his disciples the kingdom of God. This is what it's like. This is how we live. This is how we're going to save the world. Now he comes and tells them this story. It's sort of a way to wrap up. This is what we're doing, guys. Matthew 25, we're going to start in verse 14. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. The servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, the master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had trusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. So you see, you see the, the, this pattern. You have been faithful in a little bit. You have been obedient in a little bit. Now I want to trust you with much more. Verse 22, the servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I've earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. Now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant, gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We can unpack that all day. We won't. Let the Holy Spirit unpack it for you, though, this whole week. Because, but here, here are just a couple of things I want to, pull, to, to just pull out of there. The Master comes and gives us something. An opportunity. Something to steward. A person to connect with. He... He gives us an opportunity to do something. So let me just ask you this. As, as, we, as we look to 
God, what is it in my life that I can use it? What, what's, how do I use the kingdom principle in this life? So let's just ask this question. What do you have? What is he placed in your hands? Is it an opportunity? Is it a gift? Is it a talent? Is it possessions or resources? Is it influence? What do you have that's unique to you? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a connection to someone. Maybe you are friends with somebody, but you're not sure why this friend keeps hanging around. But you're like, this, this guy or this lady, I just, there's something, I'm, there's a reason I'm in his or her life. Maybe it's not even somebody you like. Maybe it's somebody that you find incredibly annoying. And you're not sure why God would have this person in your life, but this person's in your life. Just look around. What do you have? What has the master placed in your hands that he expects something of results with? What is it? What is this opportunity, this act of obedience that, 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 he's, that he's tapped you on the shoulder and he says, I, he says, I want you to do this specific thing, this specific act of obedience that might be uncomfortable for you, that might require a little bit of sacrifice for you. And your response up till now has not been because you say so I will. Your response up till now has been, that's really inconvenient. I'm not sure I want to do that. I think the master, the creator, the savior of the world, who still loves the world and still wants to save this world. I think he's still giving his children, his followers, his disciples, opportunities to do something that might require incredible acts of boldness, of courage, of strength, of sacrifice. And it may not be the big thing. It might just be the thing he's using to see what we'll do with the little thing. To see if he can trust us with the big thing. So this week, maybe today, maybe there's, maybe, I, I don't know what it is. And I'm not trying to plant something in your mind that's not there. But if the Holy Spirit has been putting something there, I just encourage you, don't let another week go by. In which you're still saying, no, I know you said so, but I won't. Let this week be the day where you say, I know you've been asking me to do that thing. To talk to that person. To make that sacrifice. And I don't get it, and I still don't like it, but because you say so, I will. He still loves the world. Let me just ask you, do you? Do you love the world? He does. He loves the people in the world. He's... Raising up leaders and he's still sending out his people and he's still starting churches. And he's still saving the world one act of obedience at a time. Because you say so. Well, let me pray for you. Father, thank you for saving us. For giving us opportunities and, and when we screw up that opportunity, you give us another one. And let this act of sacrifice that, that maybe we're thinking about right now, that this, this, this big, that may not be big and bold to everybody else, but, but to us it is. To me, it's going to take tremendous courage to take this next step. Maybe that step is, is just giving you our lives, asking you for forgiveness, asking you to just save us. And if that's the case, then give us the grace to take that step today. And talk to Pastor Ken and, and say, I'm, I'm, I'm done running. I need to get right with God. Maybe it's talking to a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker. Maybe it's stewarding a relationship well. Maybe it's giving up a relationship that we know has been very destructive for us. Whatever that is in our lives, God, give us the grace to say those words. 
because you say so today, I'll do it. And in doing this, save our world. Thank you for being that God who is holy and fills a temple, but is willing to come live in our hearts. You're that good God. We love you. In Jesus' name we ask all this. Amen. So there it is. Thank you, Billy, very much. Wow, was that a neat story about the wife? <laughs> I love good stories. I don't know if I have one better than that. And I've told lots of stories. That is neat. Kim, you're amazing. She's amazing. Boy, are you amazing to pull that little stunt. Do y'all still have a relationship with your sister? Says? It's a little tense with me. Woo, I would think so. I would say, you're a better man than I am. I don't know. If I... Wow, wow. Listen, uh, thank you for that. How challenging. And what a, what a pleasure to sit there and be able to listen to someone uh, speak. Uh, for announcements, worship time is over. I want to tell you that the Board of Elders decided we're not having our Thanksgiving luncheon this year because, well, you know, you know. However, two weeks from uh, yesterday, Saturday, two weeks, uh, Mary Ward is going to lead a team on a hike. I think y'all do that every once in a while. I can't be a participate in that but we'll meet they will meet at the church here at nine o'clock two weeks if you want to go on a hike to Indian Creek and it's a 3.3 mile hike and y'all tell me stories about the fun that you have doing that so those of you that want to go I assume you're supposed to sign up are they supposed to sign up for it um, next Sunday okay all right um anyhow what a great day. Thank you for that uh, wonderful. Yeah. You know, the sad thing is, and I know, and I'm aware of this as a speaker, often you can give a powerful message, which his was, but what is a week from now, what will you remember about the sermon? Probably nothing, but you will remember that story. I mean, unfortunately, that's the way it always is, but... Uh, I'll never forget that one. Wow. All right, guys, stand if you would. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of His Holy Spirit be with you all. And God bless you guys. Go and have a great, great week.